can you say what does it take to control a robot? Like what is the control problem of a robot? And in general, what is a robot in your view? Like how do you think of this uh, system? What is a robot? What is a robot? I think I told robotics- you ridiculous questions. No, no, it's good. Um, I mean, there's standard definitions of combining computation with some ability to do mechanical work. I think that gets us pretty close. But I think uh, robotics has this problem that once things really work, we don't call them robots anymore. Like your my dishwasher at home is pretty sophisticated, beautiful mechanisms. There's actually a pretty good computer, probably a couple of chips in there doing amazing things. We don't think of that as a robot anymore, which isn't fair. Cause then what roughly it means that robots, robotics uh, always has to solve the next problem and uh, doesn't get to celebrate its past successes. I mean, even factory room floor robots, are super successful, they're amazing. But that's not the ones, I mean, people think of them as robots, but they don't, if you, if you ask what are the successes of robotics, somehow it doesn't come to, to your mind immediately. So the definition of robot is a, a system with some level of automation that fails frequently. <laughs> Something like, it's, <laughs> it's the computation plus mechanical work uh, and uh, unsolved problem. Unsolved <laughs> <laughs> problem, yeah. So, so from a perspective of control and uh, mechanics, dynamics, what uh, what is a robot? So there are many different types of robots. The control that you need for uh, um, a Jibo robot, you know, some some robot that's sitting on your countertop and and interacting with you but not touching you, for instance, is very different than what you need for an autonomous car or an autonomous drone. Uh, it's very different than what you need for a robot that's going to walk or pick things up with its hands, right? My um, passion has always been for the places where you're interacting more, you're doing more dynamic interactions with the world. So walking, now now manipulation. And the control problems there are are beautiful. I think contact is one thing that differentiates them from many of the control problems we've solved classically, right? The modern control grew up stabilizing fighter jets that were passively unstable. And there's like amazing success stories from control all over the place. Um, power grid, I mean, there's all kinds of, it's 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 everywhere uh, that we don't even realize, just like I, AI is now. So you mentioned contact, like what's contact? So uh, an airplane is an extremely complex system or a spacecraft landing or whatever, but at least it has the luxury of um, things change relatively continuously. That's an oversimplification. But if I make a small change in the command I send to my actuator, um, then the path that the robot will take tends to take a change only by a small amount. And there's a feedback mechanism here. That's and what we're talking about. there's a feedback mechanism. And thinking about this as locally, like a linear system, for instance, you can, I can use more linear algebra tools to study systems like that, generalizations of linear algebra to, to these smooth systems. What is contact? The a robot um, has something very discontinuous that happens when it makes or breaks, when it starts touching the world. And even the way it touches or the order of contacts can change the outcome in potentially unpredictable ways, uh, not unpredictable, but uh, complex ways. I, I do think there's a little bit of, um, um, a lot of people will say that contact is hard in robotics, even to simulate. Um, and I, I think there's a little bit of a, there's truth to that, but, but maybe a misunderstanding around that. So what is limiting is that when we think about our robots and we write our simulators, we often make an assumption that that objects are rigid, and when it comes down, you know that they that their mass moves all you know stays in a constant position relative to each other itself, um, and and that leads to some some paradoxes when you go to try to talk about rigid body mechanics and contact, and so for instance, if I have a three legged stool with just a, imagine it comes to a point at the at the legs. So it's only touching the world at a point. If I draw my physics, uh, my high school physics diagram of this system, 
then there's a couple of things that I'm given by by elementary physics. I know if the system, if the table is at rest, if it's not moving, it's zero velocities. That means that the normal force, all the forces are in balance. So the the force of gravity is being countered by the forces that the ground is pushing on my table legs. I also know, since it's not rotating, that there that the moments have to balance. And since it can in it's a three-dimensional table, it could fall in any direction, it actually tells me uniquely what those three normal forces have to be. If I have four legs on my table, four-legged table, um, and they were perfectly machined to be exactly the right same height, and they're set down, and the table's not moving, then the basic conservation laws don't tell me there are many solutions for the forces that the ground could be putting on my legs that would still result result in the table not moving. Mm. Now, the reason that seems fine, I could just pick one, but it gets funny now because if you think about friction, what we th- what we think about with friction is we our, our standard model says the amount of force that you're that the table will push back if I were to now try to push my table sideways, I guess I have a table here, um, is proportional to the normal force. Mm-hmm. So if I have, if I'm very barely touching and I push, I'll slide. But if I'm pushing more and I push, I will, I'll slide less. It's called Coulomb friction is our standard model. Now, if you don't know what the normal force is on the four legs and you push the table, then you don't know what the friction forces are going to be. Right. And so you can't actually tell the laws just don't aren't explicit yet about which way the table's going to go. It could veer off to the left, it could veer off to the right, it could go straight. So the rigid body assumption of contact leaves us with some paradoxes which are annoying for for writing simulators and for writing controllers. We still do that sometimes because soft contact is potentially harder numerically or whatever. And the best simulators do both or do some combination of the two. But but anyways, because of these kind of paradoxes, there's there's all kinds of paradoxes in contact, uh, mostly due to these rigid body assumptions. It becomes very hard to like write the same kind of control laws that we've been able to be successful with for like fighter jets. We haven't been as successful writing those controllers for manipulation. I mean, so you don't know what's going to happen at the point of contact, at the moment of contact. There are situations absolutely where you, where our laws don't tell us. So the standard approach, that's okay. I mean, instead of having a differential equation, you end up with a differential inclusion, it's called. It's a set valued equation. Hmm. It says that I've, I'm in this configuration. I have these forces applied on me. Um, and there's there's a set of things that could happen, Right. And, um, and those can, aren't continuous. Any, I mean, what, uh, so w- when you say like non-smooth, yep. they're not only not smooth, but this is discontinuous. The non-smooth comes in when I make or break a new contact first, or when I transition from stick to slip. So you typically have static friction and then you'll start sliding and that'll be a discontinuous change in, in velocity, for instance. Especially if you come to rest, or the- uh, that's so fascinating. Okay, so, uh, so what do you what do you uh, do? Sorry, I interrupted you. That's um, fine. W- um, what's the hope under so much uncertainty about what's going to happen? What are you supposed to do? I mean, control has an answer for this. Robust control is one approach, but but roughly, you can write controllers which try to still perform the right task despite all the things that could possibly happen. The world might want the table to go this way and this way, but if I write a controller that um, pushes a little bit more and pushes a little bit, I can certainly make the table go in the direction I want. It just puts a little bit more of a burden on the control system, right? And these discontinuities do change the control system because um, the way we write it down right now, every different control configuration, including sticking or sliding or parts of my body that are in contact or not, looks like a different system. And I think of them, I reason about them separately or differently. And the combinatorics of that blow up, right? So I just don't have enough time to compute all the possible contact configurations of my humanoid. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, I i mean, I'm a humanoid. I have lots of degrees of freedom, lots of joints. I only, I've only been around for a handful of years. It's getting up there, but um, I haven't had time in my life 
to visit all of the states in my system, certainly all the contact configurations. So if step one is to consider every possible contact configuration that I've ever, I'll ever be in, that's probably a uh, it's probably not a problem I need to solve, right? Uh, just a, as a small tangent, what's a contact configuration? What like just so we can uh, yeah enumerate what are we talking about? Yeah, um, how many are there? The simplest example maybe would be imagine a, a robot with a flat foot, and we think about the phases of gait where the heel strikes, and then the fore, the front toe strikes, and then you can heel up toe off. Those are each different contact configurations. I only had two different contacts, but I ended up with four different contact configurations. Now, right. of course, I might have my my robot might actually have bumps on it or other things, so it could be much more subtle than that, right? But it's just even with one sort of box interacting with the ground already in in the plane <laughs> has that many, right? And if I was just even a 3D foot then it probably my left toe might touch just before my right toe and things get subtle. Now, if I'm a dexterous hand and I go to talk about just grabbing a water bottle, if every if I have to enumerate every possible order that my hand came into contact with the with the bottle, then I'm dead in the water. I, my my any approach that we were able to get away with that in walking because we mostly touch the ground within a small number of points, for instance, and we haven't been able to get dexterous hands that way. So I mean, you, you've mentioned that <laughs> people think that contact is really hard and that that's the reason that um, robotic manipulation is problem is really hard. Is there any flaws in that uh, thinking? So I think simulating contact is one aspect. And I, people often say that we don't, that one of the reasons that we have a limit in robotics is because we do not simulate contact accurately in our simulators. And I think that is, the extent to which that's true is partly because our simulators, we haven't got mature enough simulators. <laughs> there are some things that are still hard, difficult, that we should change. Um, but, but we actually, we know what the governing equations are. They have some foibles, like this indeterminacy, but we should be able to simulate them accurately. We have incredible open source community in robotics, but it actually just takes a professional engineering team a lot of work to write a very good simulator like that. 